Hi, good evening everyone and uh, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, so, we have Mr. Karthik Kumar here, who's uh, the speaker of the day. Uh, he's been with Access since 2019 uh, and is responsible for developing and managing quant strategies. Uh, prior to this, uh, he, was in, he was based out of Hong Kong, where he was the portfolio manager at Silvertree and Asia Investments, uh, managing long only and long short funds. Uh, he started out his career in 2008 with Asia Investments. Uh, he's an MBA from Cranard School of Management, Purdue University, USA, and a B in Mechanical Engineering from Mumbai, uh, from Mumbai University, and of course a CFH chart holder. Uh, so please uh, uh, welcome Mr. Karthik Kumar. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me here today. Uh, one second, sorry. Uh, is this audible? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to present today is essentially uh, what is quant investing. Uh, I'll touch on the uh, building blocks of quant investing and then I'll also talk, talk about how you look at quant products because I know uh, the audience here is a mix of allocators and uh, practitioners. So, I'll try and touch on aspects that will uh, be helpful uh, to both set of audiences. Uh, but feel free to um, ask questions uh, if uh, uh, if you have anything particular aside from what I'm talking to, uh, today, right? So to start with, uh, uh, quant at the end of the day is a systematic way of uh, basically uh, combining data from different data sources, a systematic way of uh, forming your or creating your signals and then subsequently do it with portfolio uh, construction and implementation it helps you in a very systematic approach across all the four blocks right uh, which is data integration signal construction portfolio construction and then uh, portfolio uh, rebalancing now the catch is to do all of this you need uh, data models uh, you need mathematical and statistical models which forms the uh, uh, which f forms the uh, backbone of this entire process now, the, the point is it can be used independently or it can be used by fundamental managers as well. Because traditionally when people think quant, they think it is a standalone process. But the fact is you can use two of these blocks I mentioned. I mentioned four blocks. Of these four blocks, you could use two blocks, which is uh, the fact that quant can integrate data from different data sources and create signals. Both these aspects can be used by fundamental managers to essentially uh, augment their process uh, or augment their stock selection process or sector uh, allocation processes. So that's also been done pretty extensively, at least in the West. And I know for a fact that even domestically, people are looking at options to include quant signals or quant data points to kind of improve their stock selection process. So either it can be used in a standalone process, standalone methodology, or it can be used in conjunction with a fundamental approach. But the catch is why is uh, quant as a process beginning to uh, uh, attract much more attention in our markets, right? So if you look back at data now, uh, you have a reasonable history in terms of just uh, being able to look at stocks, bottom line, uh, underlying data, and hence look at factor and style performances. So data now starts at around from 2003. So you've essentially got close to 20 years of data, which is uh, almost one and a half factor cycles or complete cycle from a, from a style perspective. Second is that all regulators across the board are kind of emphasizing on transparency, which means every market participant is being, uh, is being uh, incentivized to share more data uh, uh, out there. So which means you also have a variety of data points with good history, which, uh, and that helps you in looking for uh, newer signals. And the last part is computing parts got cheaper, you've got open source softwares like R, you've got open source softwares like Python, and even MATLAB for that matter, that lets you kind of build these quant strategies uh, and implement them at a much cheaper cost than what it was when I entered the industry. Uh, I think these open source softwares have done, uh, uh, have done a lot of good for quant as a as a investment uh, quantitative investment uh, process in general now we'll start with defining what is quant because there is a lot of misconceptions around quant right and i'll broadly talk about the misconceptions and then compare quant with fundamentals uh, now people think quant is a black box 
which need not be true. Obviously, when you talk about a quant process, it can straddle between a low frequency, low, uh, low turnover strategy to an extremely high turnover strategy. Now, within that, if you leave the high turnover strategy aside, for the most part, the entire space is not black box. The data inputs, the processes, and the holdings are quite transparent. And also, the, the managers themselves employ a lot of uh, fundamental inputs. So the process itself is not a black box. The next thing people think is it's a machine-driven process, so it has no human inputs. How will it work in a market like ours, where, uh, where there are a lot of idiosyncrasies, uh, and especially with stocks, uh, not in the large cap space, there could, be, uh, there could be issues. But the catch is this process is not devoid of human input. Uh, human input is required in each of these stages, whereas when looking at data sources, when combining data sources, cleaning your data, uh, interpreting the results of your uh, tests, and then finally putting the portfolio construction process. In each of these processes, human input is the key. So it is not that this process is uh, uh, totally devoid of human touch. Actually, there is a fair bit of uh, human input into the process. Lastly, uh, which is a traditional uh, uh, criticism, which is that these things work in history when you do the back test, uh, but it doesn't work when you actually put money to work. Now, this we call it as data mining. Obviously, one can fall prey to it. I'm not denying that. But at the end of the day, if you do the process that it should be done, taking into account a lot of the biases and making sure your testing process and your evaluation process is, uh, is statistically and mathematically sound, you can kind of avoid a lot of those errors. And also, you have a lot of forward-looking data right now in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, analyst estimates and so on and so forth. So not all of the data that you're looking at is backward-looking. So those are at least largely the uh, criticisms that I have come across uh, where, when I've talked about quant uh, uh, externally. Now the thing is, then when you compare quant with fundamentals, people think quant and fundamentals are like two opposite poles. When actually that's not the case. Quant and fundamentals have a lot uh, uh, complementary. They, are, they, they share, a lot of, uh, uh, share a lot of things. So if you think about a quant uh, process, a quant process because it uses a lot of fundamental data, quant managers also look at the same, or to a large extent also look at the same kind of data that a fundamental manager does. Uh, the difference is in how you call it, the terminologies that you refer to it, and the difference is in how you kind of crunch that data and uh, how you create a signal out of it. That is where the difference is. For instance, when a quant, uh, uh, in a quant world, we call it earnings, earnings momentum, whereas a fundamental manager would call it as earnings catalyst, wherein companies have near-term growth triggers. Now the same thing with one could say about quality where when uh, fundamental managers call a company as uh, one with safe accounting, uh, safe and sound accounting processes, a quant manager would refer to it as quality. So essentially what I'm trying to say is we are all looking at the same data uh, and calling them, referring to them in terms of different terminologies. The difference is in how you, uh, how you crunch that data, how you make a signal out of it and subsequently how you create a portfolio out of it, which is the big difference between a quant and a fundamental manager. At this point of time, I'd like to emphasize that it is not one versus the other. One process is not necessarily better than the other or vice versa. They are complementary to each other. You can almost think about it as two asset classes. Just like you wouldn't have all your money allocated to one asset class, similarly, you should not have all money allocated to any particular star, any particular uh, approach as well. You should kind of diversify across approaches. Uh, in that way, if you look at fundamental manager, a fundamental manager knows a lot about their stocks. So they prefer to have concentrated holdings, a uh, small group of holdings, and they know a lot about the stocks and they know uh, much, much more uh, about these stocks in depth and they know a lot about the sectors. And they hope to get generate alpha by betting on these stocks and betting on these sectors. Whereas a quantitative strategy is much more a probabilistic approach where you are betting on a style or signal to work, which is why you don't want concentration, you want breadth. Typically, the way IR is calculated is, or rather information ratio, which is the ability to uh, generate return for every uh, incremental risk that you're taking over and above the benchmark, is, is a function of two things, which is IC, which is information quotient, which uh, is essentially the accuracy of your investments, and second thing is breadth, which is how many times you're betting in the market. The advantage of quant as a strategy is I can evaluate my universe of 320 stocks with the same level of efficiency. It is not that I evaluate large cap with a different level of efficiency as I evaluate my mid caps and small caps. 
across my universe, I'm able to kind of evaluate the universe with the same level of efficiency, which means if I have larger breadth, then my IR can be higher, assuming my IC doesn't change, because then information ratio would be higher, because the number of times you are betting uh, on uh, new ideas kind of goes up. So that is essentially one of the advantages of a quant strategy. And the fundamental different re difference remains is that a quant strategy has much higher breadth, so you will find a lot more names in a quant portfolio as against a fundamental manager, which has lower number of names. And that is where the strengths lie for each of them, right? The benefit from a risk perspective is for a quant manager, because the position sizes are smaller, should something go wrong with any position, then the impact of that on the portfolio is quite limited uh, compared to a fundamental approach. So there are papers who have looked at what is the difference uh, in terms of performance across regions. And I've listed that papers uh, below if uh, anybody is interested. But essentially the takeaway is that for if you look at US or if you look at international markets, from a return perspective, uh, fundamental managers and, uh, 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 and quantitative managers kind of are um, like just about there. They are almost the same when it comes to returns. It's only in emerging markets that uh, uh, the quant managers had a slight advantage in terms, of, uh, in terms of returns compared to a discretionary traditional approach. But otherwise, in international US markets, it's quite, uh, it's quite neck and neck. But the one thing that is consistent, as you see on the left-hand side chart, is the tracking error. Uh, just, uh, just for everybody's reference, lower tracking error is better. So you can see that quant managers in general tend to have lower tracking errors. And the reason is because they have a lot of breadth. They have a lot of stocks in their portfolio. So obviously because you have a lot of stocks in the portfolio, your tail's longer, so your, your, your tracking error or your, risk, uh, your active risk kind of uh, is lower as well. So from a return perspective though, as you can see, there's not much uh, difference except in the emerging markets. But where you have an advantage is you look at the correlation of a traditional approach with quant. So on the right hand side chart um, here, uh, the right hand side chart here is basically that was a study done comparing uh, US uh, large cap value managers uh, and uh, large cap core managers and so on and so forth with the corresponding quant strategy to see what is the level of correlation. As you can see the level of correlation is quite limited ranging from 0.1 to 0.3 uh, and that's a very uh, small range and it's also quite low. So what this tells you is if you add a portfolio, if you add a quant portfolio to your existing portfolio of fundamental uh, funds, then you are actually strengthening your bucket because you are adding a, uh, you are adding a process which is capturing alpha from a totally different approach. And it also makes the, uh, the, uh, the resulting portfolio of funds much stronger because because the correlation is low, what it means is that when one set is doing well or one, one set is underperforming, the other kind of compensates for it. So your, the portfolio of funds has better risk adjusted, uh, uh, better risk adjusted returns compared to having uh, funds, that appro uh, funds that have the same investment approach. So uh, I'll jump into uh, what are the building blocks of quantitative uh, processes? And I'll refer to what is factors uh, over, the, over the course of this presentation, right? So factors are nothing but essentially attributes of a security that will help you kind of identify winners or help you avoid losers. These can be as simple as realized EPS growth, expected EPS growth, price to earnings, price to uh, dividend yield. It could be uh, any parameter that you could think of, but it should do one of the two things. Either it should help you identify winners or losers, or it should help you mitigate risk. And in which case you can look at uh, it as a factor. Now the factor then rolls up into different styles. And some of these styles are self-explanatory, right? Uh, there are popular styles and this goes long back. So the first style investing was value investing that started in 1930s and subsequently um, there have been a uh, lot of styles that have been identified by practitioners and uh, academicians. And the point I'm trying to make is it goes a long way back. It is not a near, it is not a recent phenomenon. What is a recent phenomenon is essentially the fact that we are now beginning to exploit this systematically. Uh, I think the quant processes took, quant strategies took off in developed markets in early 2000s. And I think we are at the same uh, phase in our markets where, um, where it looks like quant strategies also could take off from a, uh, from an allocation perspective. 
But the catch is you are looking at multiple styles here. As I mentioned in my previous slide, there are multiple styles that one could look at. The predominant ones being quality, growth, value, uh, momentum, risk, and so on and so forth. So I'll just go over a couple of styles just to give you an uh, idea of what you look for in a style, right? So uh, the one here is growth. Uh, with growth, what we typically do is uh, I'm trying typically to analyze what are the growth prospects of the company over the next 12 months or probably over the next two years. To do this, we systematically collect data from the street, largely in terms of analyst estimates, revenue, est it could be earnings estimates, revenue estimates, recommendations, how they are trending. So we look at the derivatives uh, therein as well to see uh, can we get a better understanding of the growth prospects of the company over, uh, let's say, 12, 12 months to two years. So case in point, I have two charts here, both, automobile, both are auto manufacturers. And you can see the line in maroon is essentially expected EPS, uh, expected EPS of the company over the next 12 months. And the gray chart is the, uh, the gray line is the price uh, of, of that stock. The same thing on the right, si right hand side. Two things what you notice is that um, essentially there is a good correlation between the trend in EPS and the, uh, the price trend across both these charts. And the other thing you notice is that essentially the EPS of the stock is, itself is not stagnant. Most people think that the expected EPS changes only during quarterly results or when they have the analyst day or so on and so forth. But the fact is analysts are constantly evaluating, uh, constantly evaluating the growth prospects of the company and constantly revising uh, their estimates uh, depending on what they see there in the market. Uh, it, could be, it could be to do with macro factors, micro factors that depends on it. And the other thing is, even if the company that you hold, if there is no change in the earnings expectation, there are other companies in, your, in the sector, other companies in the sector that could be seeing changes in their earnings trajectory, which again will impact how your stock prices move. So to that extent, it, it, there is a lot of value to tracking these parameters. People may think that the EPS data is kind of... Uh, is, uh, is kind of that information is kind of uh, uh, incorporated in the markets, but as these ch charts show you, there is value to tracking these things and how they evolve over time. So that is just to give you a flavor of growth as, as, as a strategy. The next thing is quality. So uh, uh, quality essentially can be broken down into three aspects. Uh, one can look at it different ways. Obviously, with quality, people also look at it in a, in a qualitative way, meaning uh, you, you evaluate how good the management is and so on and so forth. So there are soft parameters that fundamental managers look at. But from a quantitative perspective, there are three parameters. We break it down into three groups. One is you look at volatility based on price, uh, price measures. So you could look at vo uh, volatility of the stock. You could look at beta and so on and so forth. Second thing, you could look at the volatility of the business itself. So you can look at volatility of the fundamental parameters. And third, uh, one could look at is how is, the manage, uh, how is the company addressing the management agency problem? So you could look at things like accruals, you can, uh, you can look at uh, uh, things like dilution and so on and so forth uh, within that category. So essentially quality can be broken down into uh, three subcategories. Now, what I've done here is I've, sh I've taken ROE, for instance, and this is for the period between 2011 and 2015. What we did is we took the universe of uh, stocks, the entire universe of our universe of stocks, and broke it down into five buckets and grouped them based on their ROE. So the one on the extreme right is the, uh, is the high ROE bucket, and the one on the extreme uh, left is the low ROE bucket. And then we track the performance of this bucket on a monthly basis. So every month we would rebalance it and then track the performance in the subsequent month. And this, for the, this was for the period between 2011 to 2015. And what you notice is that the high ROE bucket outperforms the low ROE bucket by substantial margin and everything in between is monotonic. By that I mean the fourth bucket which is the next best ROE bucket is better than the other three and so on and so forth. So what it tells you is that during this period, ROE was, as a, as a factor, was good in uh, differentiating between winners and losers. So firstly, you can call it a, a good factor. And it is also representative of quality in a sense. So it's maybe it's something that one can look at. Uh, it's quite popular. Uh, uh, the metric itself is quite popular, which is why I used it. But having said that, I, uh, as I mentioned previously, quality can be broken down into three subcategories, not necessarily just ROE. So there is much wider definition of quality than 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 just this, right? Now, once you identify, once you uh, have an understanding of the factors and sec uh, and and the styles, the question is, how do you construct these factors? Most people think. 
factors are basically ratios, so you can just take canned numbers that data providers give you, and it is quite straightforward and simple in that sense. But actually, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of details behind this. It's not as simple as saying uh, you just take it from one of the data vendors and just use it as 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 they give it to you. Because if you just take even something as simple as a P ratio and you break it down into the E and P component, which is earnings and price, within earnings you have an option of going by historical earnings, you have an option of going by estimated earnings, and even within historical earnings, do you want to adjust for one-time events, do you want to adjust for uh, uh, how you classify R&D expenditure, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of variability around how you define earnings. And then you do take price options, you have an option of looking at last month's price, you have an option of looking at uh, a moving average price, or you have an uh, option of looking at month end price. So the factor construction itself is not as uh, clear cut or straightforward that you just go and take, take it from the data vendors. Now once you've gone past that, then the question is how do you compare these things? Because what I'm showing here is essentially, let's say, Obviously, these, this is for illustrative purposes, but essentially there are two sectors here, technology and utilities. And you take stock B and you take stock F. So stock B has a price to earnings ratio of uh, 30 and stock F has a price to earnings ratio of 25. Now, if you were to compare it on an absolute basis, you would say stock B is the costlier stock and stock, uh, stock F is the cheaper stock. But maybe there's other way of looking at it. Maybe you don't look at it versus on an absolute basis, you look at it versus sectors. In which case, you'll note technology being a high growth sector typically has higher valuations than utilities. So if you look at vis-a-vis -vis sector, you notice is that stock B is trading at a premium of 57.89%, whereas stock E is actually, sorry, stock F is trading at a premium of almost 82, 82%. So that makes stock, uh, stock F costlier than stock B, uh, which is the right answer that depends on what approach you're going to take. And you could make the same case with stock E and stock A as to which one is cheaper. Uh, whether you go by absolute valuations or whether you go by relative valuations. And the answer changes based on parameter, the answer, answer changes based on style. So that is the other level of complexity. And all this has a bearing on the end returns. So this, is, this was a study done just for period 2015 to 18, right? So if you calculate your price, to the, and this was specifically for the US markets. So if you, uh, if you calculate your price to earnings ratio based on realized earnings as against expected earnings, the differential in return was almost 2%, wherein the realized earnings, uh, price to realized earnings did much better. And if you were to then look at your price to earnings in an absolute sense as against a sector neutral approach, by that what I mean is if you were to say an absolute approach is where you say stock B is costlier than stock F because the price to earnings ratio is 30 and price to earnings ratio for stock F is 25. That's the absolute approach. In a sector neutral approach, you will look at the premiums relative to the sector. So you'll say essentially after comparing it to the sector, stock F looks much costlier than stock B because it is trading at a much higher premium. So you adjust for the sector levels in a sector neutral approach. So when you do that, you notice is that the sector neutral approach actually does better than the absolute approach in this period, 2015 to 2018. So there is a lot of nuances to how you calculate these factors, how you compare these factors across the universe. And what I've not touched on, touched on here is basically how you clean these factors as well, because the data is not clean, you have to clean the data, you have to look at how do you treat the outliers, because that is a separate job in itself to make sure that the outliers don't affect your results, or else outliers can affect your results both in your testing and subsequently in production when you kind of uh, deploy your models. So there is, uh, there is a lot of information in, in terms of how you put these factors together. The next part is now that you've identified factors, you've identified styles, you've looked at what are the intricacies in constructing the factors and what are the different ways of looking at it. Next thing is you look at these, these styles and you notice is that like uh, different asset classes, they have their own cycles. Now this is based on an MSCI paper and this is for the US markets for, uh, from 88, uh, 1988 to 2013. And what they've done is they've basically tracked all these styles uh, through time. What you notice is that all these styles have their own cycles, have their own peaks and troughs. And the average period of underperformance is around three years. 
and some of these styles have much higher under uh, periods of underperformance. So the point I'm trying to make is essentially like asset classes, these also have their own cycles. And so there are two ways of addressing this. One is that you have to look at longer time horizons when you're investing in, in, in these styles. Second is that you, there is a benefit of diversification. Just like you, would, you don't want to invest all in equities and all in fixed income, you should actually diversify between these styles. And you should have more diversification in your uh, quantitative approach from a style perspective. So how do you diversify? Now there are three processes, three ways you can do it. Obviously there are uh, other ways to do it as well, but largely there are three ways to combine styles. One is essentially you take each of these styles and you invest in the intersection of these styles. Essentially saying if you, for instance, if you take quality, value and growth and then you invest in the intersection of the styles, what you're saying is essentially I'm doing kind of a QGARP approach, which is a portfolio of quality stocks at, uh, with good growth at reasonable prices because that is the intersection you're looking at. That is one way of doing it. The other is you identify you first put together your growth portfolio, you put together your value portfolio, and then you put together a quality portfolio. And then allocate uh, money to it depending on how you want to do it. So let's say you could allocate 30% to growth, 40% uh, to value, and 30% to quality. Or I'm just making, making an example of. So you could do that. And then you could rebalance each of these portfolios individually at whatever rebalancing frequency you choose to, and that is your composite portfolio. Essentially what you're doing is you're basically managing three sub portfolios here. Each of these is a portfolio and you are managing three sub portfolios to kind of manage the, uh, the overall portfolio. The, the other process is a stepwise approach where you say, I want to be in case in point here, for example, I want to be quality biased. So then you say, I will first filter my universe of stocks based on quality. Then within that, I will look for growth. And once I've kind of filtered based on quality and growth, and then subsequently I look at value within, within, within that spectrum. So you're taking a stepwise approach to kind of put your portfolio together. So as you can see, there are different ways of blending the signals, and each of those has its advantages and disadvantages. For instance, I'll talk about this, this component. So let's say you put together your portfolio by having three sub -individual, three individual portfolios. The danger, the, the, the advantage of it is it is very easy to, easy to manage. You can easily attribute the returns. You clearly know what percentage of your uh, outperformance or underperformance is coming from each of these sub portfolios. So to that extent, there is clarity in terms of what each portfolio is doing. But the problem is, let's say you are in the growth portfolio, you have a lot of these high growth stocks because it's a, uh, you are investing in the extremes. You may have a lot of high growth stocks that are also high in valuations. Now what could happen is as a result of which the value exposure of your portfolio could actually deteriorate. So while you think you have value exposure in your portfolio and so when value does well, your portfolio should do well, the problem is that or the problem could be that because you have high growth stocks with extremely high valuations, uh, that can prove as a detractor uh, when value works. So you have this problem where you, you have stocks that have characteristics that don't kind of line up with the other two characteristics. The same, you could, have a, uh, you could have a lot of value stocks with poor quality, but the aim is you want to have a portfolio with good growth, good value, good quality. So that is essentially a problem of combining, having three portfolios and kind of merging them and tracking them on an individual basis. I mean, we can go through the other strategies as well if uh, anybody is interested, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is, um, there, are, there, there are different approaches in terms of how you blend it. Each of them come with its advantages and disadvantages. So one has to be aware of uh, what are the repercussions of the decision that you are taking. But anyways, let's assume that you go ahead and combine the strategy. So now what I've done is I've used this particular strategy where you combine these three strategies and kind of invest in the intersection. So what we did is for the period of 2011 to 2019, we ran five portfolios. So individually, we ran growth portfolio, price trend portfolio, value portfolio, quality portfolio, and then we ran a combined portfolio. The way we ran the combined portfolio is based on this measure, where we combine all the signals and then invest in the intersection. Right. What you notice is that the first thing that stands out is value had a horrible last decade. The return on that is pretty poor. It underperformed every other strategy 
and it un underperformed your BSC 200. Sorry. Second, the volatility is much higher than the volatility of any of the other styles. And the third part is the drawdown was also substantially higher than drawdown of any of the individual styles. Right? Uh, and quality was the uh, price trend was the best performing ma metric closely followed by quality and growth. But the beauty is when you kind of combine these styles, the combined portfolio has a return, uh, has an annualized return that is better than each of these individual portfolios. Right? And the volatility is lower than all but quality. So quality has a uh, annualized volatility of 19.5, whereas the combined strategy has a volatility of 21.7. But notice the sharp ratio on the combined one is 0.73, whereas the sharp ratio on quality is 0.62, which means even though you have a slightly, you have incrementally higher risk slightly, but then you are being more than compensated by higher risk adjusted returns. So essentially, uh, even though you are taking slightly higher risk, you are getting much more return to compensate for the fact that you are taking slightly higher risk. And most importantly, even the drawdown is, uh, is slightly lower. So the combined portfolio does well uh, compared to each of these individual styles across metrics, right? That is quite consistent. And why does that happen? That happens because the correlation of these styles is pretty low. The highest correlation, as you can see, is between growth and price here, which is 0.36. Now the value correlations are negative, but I'll put that caveat out there because value didn't work over the last decade. So it could be largely just last year, sorry, last decade that caused that correlation to be as low. Typically, if you look at longer term cycles, uh, the correlation tends to be uh, positive, but it tends to be, uh, uh, the, the number tends to be small, so, uh, but it is not negative. But I think it's of the fact that over uh, 2010 to 2020, for whatever reasons we can discuss in detail, uh, value kind of underperformed substantially, which causes these correlations to go down. The benefit is when you have these styles that are not as correlated, when you combine them, you get the benefit of diversification, almost like running a sector strategy, right? You you. Uh, think about it as uh, investing in purely sector funds versus a multi-sector approach. Uh, if you have a healthcare fund, then it has its own cycle and the cycles tend to have higher peaks and higher troughs. Whereas if you have a multi-sector approach, then your peaks and troughs, uh, as in the out extent of outperformance, extent of underperformance kind of goes down and you get a much smoother ride. You don't get as much ha heartaches if you were invested in just one sector. And if you want to take an extreme, you can take materials, which has substantially uh, higher volatility. But the point I'm trying to make is, it's almost an analogy, almost like you would think about a multi-sector approach being uh, much better from a risk uh, return perspective. Similarly, a multi-style approach is, is a better from a, from, a, from a risk return perspective as well. So which is why you would combine it, right? But the signal alone doesn't, uh, is not the only thing that matters. So for instance, you could do Sorry. I had a question on the combined portfolio. Yes. Uh, while everyone might have their own, uh, you know, uh, risk measures, yeah. uh, over time, what do you think uh, would be the sort of the best combination of the three in terms of weightage, like how much weight that, that would have worked over market cycles? So are you referring to the weight allocation to these styles or you're referring to these approaches? The weight allocation to each style. The weight allocation, again, uh, the weight allocation to style also comes down to, as I'll refer, it also comes down to how you look at the process and you as a business house, right? So, which is where I think human input is, uh, is a critical component in all of this. Uh, because uh, when you are designing these, uh, these, these models, while we have 20 years of data, developed market have much longer data, right? Uh, so you have one and a half factor cycles. So there is still, so when you put your final model together, it is both a combination of art and science. So somebody could have looked at it over in 2020 and said quality has done extremely well over that decade. And so maybe you are past the peak of the cycle and maybe we shouldn't allocate as much as backtest suggest that you should be allocating quality, you should be allocating to quality. And then you reduce the weight to quality and then say I will have probably a bit more to valuations because value well, didn't do as well, right, over here. So given that we have 20 years data, which is good, but it is not, you, you don't have more than two factor cycles, you don't have, so there is room for subjectivity there. Uh, and it depends on how you want to put it together. Um, that's, so it's not clear cut, given that we don't have as much history as, as some of the other developed markets do, right? Um, does that? Yeah, 
when you say combining styles, how hmm. are you combining these I am combining based on this approach, where you are basically investing in the intersection of these three styles. So, uh, that is the approach I have used to kind of calculate the combined portfolio. So, Uh, mm, yeah. speaks, what, is what is in the intersection? Which is which is the point I'm trying to make in the sense that because the correlations are lower, when you kind of combine it, you get a diversification benefit. No, I was talking about absolute return. If it's sixteen percent, yeah. Whereas the best return is in price trend, which is thirteen percent. Yes. If you take average, actually, the standard way is that if you take an average, it should yeah. go up to lower. Yeah. If you take much higher. Yeah. If you take an if average. If you take an average, you will be taking this approach to portfolio construction. Uh, we have taken the earlier one, the first one. You have taken the subset. Yeah, we have taken the subset. Uh, now, the, now, the catch here is, uh, it is not just because you are, in, uh, yes, you are investing in an intersection, which is why it is working. But also, what happens is each of these things have their own cycle, right? So, like I showed you here, each of these things have their own cycle. So, your volatility of the resulting portfolio. So, even though value did not perform, actually, I have the combined portfolio here, but even if you combine, let's say, uh, a price trend with value over that period, that outcome will be better because while value on its own, value in combination with some style will add to it because it will help you improve one of these metrics and hence combining it kind of uh, kind of helps. I'm just giving you an example, but essentially the, the, the diversification benefit kind of kicks in because of lower correlations. In the, in the sense, this is over a longer period. Correct. Now, does this hold true for individual uh, within that sub period within that uh, time cycle? So, within that sub periods, you could get anomalies. For instance, last year, uh, except for value, none of the strategies worked. Value barely managed to keep up with the benchmark. It was just about it kept up with the benchmark. If you man, if you calculate style performances, uh, stripping out other effects like cap effects and volatility effect, value barely managed to keep up with the benchmark. Whereas all the other three styles underperformed, which is kind of anomaly. Uh, which is why you also saw a lot of uh, uh, strategies, be it fundamental manager or quant managers, kind of underperforming last year. Because at the end of the day, each of these managers has a bias to some style. So either they are growth or they value or their quality so unless you are completely betting on value and unless you are uh, you got your stock specific picks right last year was quite a struggle because all three strategies underperformed the point i'm trying to make is while you may get anomalies like that in any particular year large stays true that the benefit of combining is much better than running individual strategy just like uh, you you think about it almost as a uh, uh, comparable to a sector fund uh, that's that's the way i would come uh, come uh, look at it this correlation sorry come again this correlation yeah uh, between returns of the companies in each of these baskets or so it is correlation is between the returns of the styles so you look at the style performances and you look at what is the correlation of these styles uh, and you look you, and that's the number Yes. No, not really. Uh, you you could arrive at different answers uh, based on that because the intersection would look at valuation. Uh, it it would look at the inter. Uh, so so the problem is. Uh, firstly, you will get lesser number of stocks here because you are you are culling it uh, much higher. And second thing, what is value within quality? If you if you follow this spectrum, what is value? Once you get down, first filter by growth. Well, first you filter by quality, then you filter by growth, and what you get in then you look at value. Maybe you are just looking at this spectrum, which is much closer to valuation, but may, you may not be investing here, right? So you may not get to this point. You could. I'm not. I'm not denying this, but essentially, if you start chopping at one layer. So, you would still be at, uh, you would still be invested in stocks that are trading at a valuation premium to the market. But it, these are still the cheapest stocks within the quality bucket. Think about it that way, right? So, once you have filtered for quality and growth, you could still be you investing the cheapest stock within that, that subset, but you could still be investing in stocks that are trading at a premium to market itself. Whereas here, you are looking at absolute intersection of these styles, right? Uh, can I move? Yeah, please. So, uh, depending on how you define individual factors, yeah. the triangle that you showed will change the shape of that triangle. And, uh, do you have any study or come across any study which will uh, try to explain that and try to optimize that? How you, because there are, this is just one picture of, say, five, seven year cycle. Yep. And this is point to point return, secondly. Uh, probably, uh, we are not looking at. 
probably this uh, as you said that back testing may not work in future that is one of the criticisms. Sorry, come again? Back testing may not work in future okay. that is one of the criticisms. Okay. So because we are looking at very short window and uh, we are not slicing it in uh, various different ways. Hmm. So how do you uh, in your uh, portfolio master, how do you try to answer that so that you, you are not uh, You are considering all other possibilities that could have happened in that period, hmm. so that you address that uh, question right at the beginning of construction. Okay. Uh, this answers your question. But essentially, what you do is, uh, as you rightly pointed out, there are many ways of. Uh, many ways of defining each of these parameters quality growth value right there is no there is no one way because you can uh, as i showed you factors can be constructed in the previous slide you can define factors in n number of ways uh, not n number of ways but there are a few different ways how you define factors how you compare it and so on and so forth so there is that variety in there now as to which approach to use that comes down to your testing process that is where the ip is as to how you test that factor how you make sure that the factor you are using uh, or the way you are constructing and the way you are, uh, you are uh, uh, whether you use an absolute approach or a sector neutral approach, that is where the IP is, uh, how, how you look at it. But to make sure that you are actually looking at a factor that will work over cycles, what we, what, at least what I do is, typically there is a lot more uh, research that happens in global markets. And I have also had the experience of working in other markets as well. So typically, I look at signals that has worked for more in more than one market. And definitely more, it is, it is ideal if those signals work outside of India as well. Because the catch is, then there is, uh, there is a concrete behavioral logic or a risk-based logic as to why a particular uh, style should work. Now, you could have a case where a particular a particular metric or a particular style only works in India. There is no harm in that. But just that you have to be very careful and you have to analyze as to why is it that it only works in India? Why is it that it doesn't work elsewhere in the globe? Uh, because at the end of the day, investment investor rational is same. Investors want to get paid for the risk that they're taking. So why is it that it's not getting paid in, let's say, Europe for that matter, and it is getting paid in India? Most, most likely the answer is because we have a structure domestically, a market structure, which kind of uh, enables that particular parameter to work. In which case you have to track it because when the day that goes away, your factor will also stop working because it is a very transient process. So, uh, my preference in such cases is to look at signals that work across geographies and not just in our markets. Sorry, I think there was a question uh, behind as well. Yeah. No, the, the weights are uh, the weights are roughly equal uh, between uh, growth, uh, growth price trend and quality slightly lower, but roughly equal. Can I move ahead? So the point is, once you're done with uh, signal construction, that is not an end in itself. So what you could do is you could construct, let's say. Uh, basket based on ROE as I said or price to earnings and you could choose to invest in the uh, portfolio of stocks with the best or the cheapest price to earnings or the best ROE. The problem with that is you are missing one critical component which is risk and so which is and just to put things in context let's say you have an alpha signal you have a signal however you want to define it uh, a combined individual let's say you agreed on we've all agreed on one and let's say it's growth for instance. And let's say there are two stocks here with similar growth expect return expectations, right? Very close. But you can see the risk on stock B is much higher than risk on stock A. So what that means is that the expected sharp ratio on B is much higher than expected sharp ratio on stock A, which is indicated by the size of the circle here. So the point here is if you take risk into account, despite the fact that your quant signal is telling you that you have similar expected returns, you should be still allocating higher weight to stock B than stock A because risk adjusted from a risk adjusted perspective, stock B looks much better than stock A. Now, if stock A had much higher returns, so it would have drifted to the right. So if it had much higher returns, then it, it is likely that it could have, the returns would have compensated for the higher risk. Then your expected sharp ratio would be better, which means that you could allocate equal and maybe even more weight than stock B. 
So the point here is you should take not just return into account, but you, could, you should also take risk into account and not just invest in a bucket of, let's say, top 10 stocks based on ROE, top, top 10 stocks based on price to earnings, because that completely ignores another aspect of uh, portfolio construction. So typically, most risk at the end of the day is, I mean, uh, it's, it's volatility of the stock. But we look at, uh, in terms of risk model constructions, there are a lot of open source risk models like MSCI, Bar and so on and so forth, which look at essentially risk and break down the risk into contribu contributions based on factors and so on and so, uh, so forth. So there are risk models that help you break down that risk and compare uh, your uh, factor exposures uh, from a return perspective and from a risk perspective. So once you've done that, then you get into portfolio construction. Actually, the thing about quants in general is people only focus on signals. It is like, what signals do you have? Uh, and the cutting edge uh, or the research is predominantly focused on uh, or tends to be focused on signals. But the fact is, portfolio construction is equally important, if not more, than, than uh, signals itself. So typically, the way it happens is once you have your, uh, once you have your expected returns, based on whatever signal you develop and you have your risk, then the question is how do you put the portfolio together? The few things, uh, most th uh, like parameters that most quant process would take into account is what is the sector concentration that you would want to have? What is the uh, stock concentration you want to have? What is the turnover that you want to have? The turnover will depend on the kind of signals you use. If the signals you use have a faster decay, then you might want to have higher turnover. If the signals that you have uh, are lower decay, then you want to have lower turnover. For instance, um, if you use a value factor, then these value factors don't change overnight. They don't change even in months. So you can deploy it. So you, you essentially, you can deploy it slowly. Uh, and so there is no hurry to deploy. So it can take a larger capacity uh, and the turnover need not be high. Whereas if you take something like a momentum factor, the problem, the catch with momentum is it, that it decays very quickly. So you have to implement your signal very quickly, which means there is a constraint on capacity and also means that it would require a higher turnover. So how you define your signals will also have repercussions on each of these parameters, which is sector concentration, stock concentration, turnover, uh, market impact costs, and so on and so forth. So all these things kind of come into uh, portfolio construction and needs to be taken into account while uh, you, are, you are building this, uh, this uh, portion, right? Now, once you've done that, um, I just want to touch on product possibilities. The beauty about quant is once you have your infrastructure set up uh, in terms of uh, the signals, in terms of risk, in terms of portfolio construction process, then there is a whole range of strategies you can kind of crank out. It is almost like a factory. Once you have it, then you can kind of build strategies that you want to, uh, you can have bespoke uh, solutions uh, uh, much, much more easily than, let's say, a fundamental approach in that sense. So you can straddle the entire spectrum. Um, you can go from smart beta, which is like a passive plus product, which has low tracking error, uh, and it is a low fee structure product, uh, and it's also low complexity. And then you can go to the extreme right, which is long shot strategies, which is completely actively managed. It has high complexity. Uh, it has high tracking error and high turnover as well. And then you, in between, you have traditional actively managed long only strategies that kind of fall in between the two categories. The beauty is once you have the setup, then you can kind of create all these uh, so, uh, solutions uh, seamlessly and you can kind of manage and monitor the portfolios accordingly. Obviously, the signals will have to be catered to each of these products. Uh, the portfolio construction process has to take into account uh, the intricacies of each of these products, the tax repercussions of each of these products. But at the end of the day, the infrastructure is there for you to kind of uh, make the entire uh, product suit or develop the entire product suit. Right? So from an allocator's perspective, right, what are the things to look at when you are looking at quant products? The first thing that people say is uh, quant processes are systematic and have no human biases. I think it has to be qualified. It is not wrong, but it has to be qualified. A quant process implementation is completely systematic, but the, po but the model uh, design process has a lot of human inputs into that process. So the way you choose your data, pro data sources, the way you clean up your data, the way you treat your outliers, uh, the way you interpret the results and put together a final portfolio and then your portfolio construction process. All of these things have a large human uh, input 
into how you do these things. What is systematic is once you've decided on these things, then subsequently uh, implementing the portfolio and then subsequently rebalancing the portfolio, all of those tend to be systematic. So it is not devoid of hu human, input, uh, human input. So to that extent, one has to understand what are, what are the biases in a current model. And when I say biases, I don't mean in a negative sense. Uh, it is almost like what is the investment philosophy. Uh, to the question that was previously asked, you could build a quant model with a value bias because you think quality has done extremely well over the last 10 years, so I want to build a model that is much more biased to value. Or you look at historical data and say, this is what history has told me and I'm going to follow the same set of, uh, I'm going to follow distribution based on what the history has told me and you can build a model based on that. So the model construction process has certain assumptions, uh, certain uh, in investment philosophy of the house or the person concerned that is taken into account. So you have to understand that in your process. The second thing is to understand how frequently the model is reviewed and how frequent and under what circumstances is the model rebalanced or model uh, modified. Sorry, let me rephrase it. How frequency, how frequently it is reviewed and how free uh, and under what circumstances is it modified. Uh, because th th that will have ramifications in terms of uh, how the process uh, develops over time. So for instance, let's say you change the model only when you get a new signal. That is one way of looking at the model. The other way of looking at a model is to take qualitative or to take a call saying now this factor has worked really well so I am going to manually irrespective of what the history tells me or what my st statistical process tells me, I am going to manually make a call of uh, uh, reducing allocation to a particular style and increasing allocation to, a, uh, to another style. So that is a separate process. So each of these will have repercussions in terms of how you do it. So you have to understand under what circumstances the model will be reviewed and how, what will cause the model to change as part of any process, right? So that is important. Second thing, from a portfolio construction standpoint, like you would do with uh, all fundamental strategies, one needs to look at what is the sector concentration, what is the stock concentration, what are the turnover limits, cap allocation, what decides the cap allocation, and also liquidity criteria, which kind of rolls in into sec stock concentration in some way or the other, right? So you have to look at all of this. But in addition to this, the other thing that has to be looked at is to say under what circumstances will uh, the portfolio manager overrule the model? So to say, under what circumstances will you make a call that the model doesn't know something that you know of and so you're going to overrule the model. And even within that, there are, uh, there are varieties. So let's say a model comes up with a pick, uh, with a stock pick, uh, X, Y, Z, and then you as a manager think that there is, a, uh, there is some information that the model can't incorporate. So I don't want to have X, Y, Z in my portfolio. So I'll eliminate that stock and then rerun the process again. So that is one way of having a manual intervention. There is another way of manual intervention where you say, uh, well, the model doesn't like this stock X, Y, Z, but I'm still going to go and include it because I think there is something in that stock which is going to uh, uh, result in uh, alpha with regards to that particular stock. That is the other way of doing it. Uh, I mean, uh, so the human inputs can have an, uh, uh, human interference can have a material say on how the, how the processes work in the longer run. Just like with every other process, discipline is key. And from my, my rationale and my approach is that you should be very selective about interfering in the model and interfering the process. Because as a portfolio manager, my forte or my expertise is in developing the model, is in uh, making sure that I'm choosing the right kind of parameters, I'm putting to the, uh, together a process that is robust. With regards to stock specific actions, I would rather have that information come through the model than actually make manual calls myself. So, so that is a very important thing that you have to take into account whether when do portfolio managers kind of make that intervention and under what circumstances and how frequently they do it. So I think those are the parameters that you would want to look at from an allocator standpoint uh, in terms of evaluating ev evaluating con portfolios. Um, that's pretty much what I have. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions outside of these topics or uh, if there's anything else on any of the other slides that you discussed, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first of all, model building. Yeah. When you say, I mean, you So 
there, there is a whole uh, way of how you uh, test factors. So you take, uh, so for instance, this is one simplest way of testing factors, right? Um, sorry, let me go back. This is one simplest way of testing factors. This is the, the, the basic way of testing factors, where you take a particular parameter and look at, does the parameter have the ability to kind of discern between good and bad stocks? You could do this across, you could do this across parameters. So here what I've done is you've taken the best ROE stocks and then you looked at the low ROE stocks and then you say, is there, does the market actually reward high ROE stocks over low ROE stocks? This is like the simplest measure. And from there on, there are multiple other ways that you can evaluate your results because when you are, so let's say you are combining two signals, it gets complicated then because when you get, you are combining two signals, you want to make sure that those two signals are actually different and those, those are not capturing the same information. Because if not, then you are basically doubling down on the same number, right? So there are ways of evaluating signals and when you are combining them, there are ways of uh, checking uh, uh, and making sure that you are not, those two, those two signals are actually bringing different sets of information and then you are not doubling. So there is a, there is a much longer process in terms of how you do those things. Yes, yes. Uh, so most of, uh, at least personally, we do an optimization process. And come again, sorry. Yes, yes. Yes. So in, when you are designing your system, obviously you have to take trading costs into account uh, because there are some signals that are, let's say, uh, high turnover signals, short term signals. Uh, if you take out trading costs, th those signals would look extremely good. But once you start putting in even like uh, very conservative uh, uh, trading cost assumptions, then the return profile would would uh, would uh, basically degrade substantially. And then once you start uh, taking into account uh, the size of the strategy, then it gets even worse. So you have to take a lot of things into account going from uh, cost of trading uh, and even size, how much you want to deploy, what is the target. Uh, size that you're looking at and so on and so on. Because some styles can take size, some styles can't take size. So you have to be aware about what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, style you're looking at, what kind of product you are uh, designing. Can you elaborate on what kind of biases people generally get when they are back testing? Because when, when you actually want to implement, you will get those yeah. faulty results. And second thing is, uh, when you are looking at fundamental factors, uh, maybe PNL and balance sheet, uh, based on accounting conventions, though data may change. So how do you handle that? Huh. So the first part, the most common uh, error people make is uh, Essentially, uh, uh, in terms of data, you have to be careful to line up the data, for instance, very simple thing. Uh, so if you take a database, you take, put it by calendar year, it will show based on, based on, uh, uh, based on the, uh, the fiscal uh, year, then it will show the data came in, in, let's say, at the start of the, uh, at the start of the fiscal year. The reality is that data actually comes much later. So you have to account for things like that as to when does that data come. Because in reality, while in backtest you will have that data beginning in Jan, in reality the, jan the number only came in April or May. So where, when you implement your models, you won't have the latest data. You will only get it much later. So you have to take into account things like data lag effects. So then the other thing is survivorship bias. Uh, that's another thing that, that is quite common out there in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of errors that, that you could see there. Third thing is uh, a challenge with our markets is that you 20 years is good deal. I when I started, it was just two to six seven years of data uh, that we had uh, that we could rely on. Uh, but now you have 20 years, but still uh, it is not a substantially long period uh, in in the sense that you can't form conclusive. Uh, uh, you can't have a conclusive opinion on quite a few things. So there is some, as I said, it's a mix of art and science. So um, that is another thing that you have to be careful about. And sorry, what was the other question that you had? Based on different accounting conventions, the data changes. Yes. So past data may not be uh, changed. The data may uh, be different. So how do you handle that? So that is the part of the job. You have to define your parameters. You have to, which is why you can't just blindly take canned parameters like a data data vendor would give you or uh, I mean 
a lot of data vendors, to be fair, also standardize data uh, and give it to you. Uh, uh, let me let me clarify that. But having said that, it is that is where uh, the crux is. You have to clean the data yourself. Uh, you talked about differences in accounting uh, parameters. The other thing is also hand handling outliers, uh, identifying outliers, handling outliers, identifying uh, wrong data, uh, handling that. That is the challenge. I had a question about sources of data. Yeah. What are, what are few examples of data? Uh, so largely the data vendors internationally are your uh, writers uh, or uh, Refinitiv as they call it these days. Refinitiv, Bloomberg, uh, Factset. Uh, I think you get a lot of these, uh, I haven't played around with myself, but, but you get a lot of these websites that have screeners and things online these days. Yes. <laughs> but, but that's where data gets expensive. So, so the catch is earlier, uh, uh, earlier both aspects were expensive. When I started, the data is expensive and even the, uh, you didn't have as, as many libraries around Python R or something. So even the, uh, the testing process or even the, uh, the, uh, the, the whole framework around implementing, implementing the strategy was expensive. Uh, now that has kind of come down with open source softwares and, and MATLAB also included because it is not as expensive. But the data part still remains, uh, it's, it's still expensive. Because without data, you know, we cannot experiment online. Yes, I would agree, but data is where it, is, it gets expensive. Uh, there is, there is, uh, there is, there is no getting, uh, there is no getting around that. So that is, uh, in, yeah. Please. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I imagine for model building, you know, you need to have a very strong maths background. Now, yeah. uh, personally, maths has never been my strong subject. Hmm. So I can, I imagine, can be a very complex process. So what can you do? Or what can you learn to avoid, you know, uh, putting in faulty inputs in the, in the, in the model? So what can you, hmm. what can you do? What can you learn? I mean. Especially once if someone's maths background isn't that strong. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, it's a very difficult question. Uh, uh, you, you uh, I think you'd have to have a certain basic uh, understanding of statistics and mathematics to kind of get started. Uh, that at best is the that that is a bare minimum. You can't you can't do away with that. Um, I, I think there is no getting away from that. Would it help if you? Uh, some programming languages like R or no, programming, see programming languages at the day of at the end of the day is an enabler. Uh, it is uh, so irrespective of which programming language you know, it helps you. It's also it's a tool that helps you achieve the end objective. But the fact is, uh, you still need to understand that data. You still need to uh, kind of understand the model building process and so on and so forth. So. Obviously, the tool will help you. It will make your life easier. If you use a great tool, then it will make your life easier, much easier. But at the end of the day, you can't kind of uh, shrug away your responsibility in kind of building the inputs and, and evaluating the model. Yep. Can you go back to the chart of two auto manufacturers? Yes, please. Uh, one second. Uh, yes. See, the starting point is just because any parameter works, you shouldn't be using it. There has to be a rationale as to why any particular parameter works, right? So you are starting with a, it's not just, you have to differentiate between uh, the relationship which is purely coincidental and there actually being a causation there, right? So uh, there is the, that aspect. And second thing, it has to have a valid reason as to why that parameter has to work. And 
as I said previously, you, you can't kind of look at two months and three months and say this particular uh, style hasn't worked or this particular factor hasn't worked because like stocks, like stocks don't work every month. Even your multi-bagger, if you happen to be in those multi-baggers, they wouldn't work every month. They'll have their periods of uh, time correction or absolute correction and then that doesn't make that stock bad in any way. So similarly, these styles, it doesn't make it bad in any way. What you need to look at is you need to look at these things over a cycle or you need to look at it over an extended period of time to make sure that it's adding value, uh, let's say majority of the cases. So you are better off being in there. And at the end of the day, what is the hit ratio, ratio of most success, like mostly successful managers, unless you take the uh, really extreme uh, outliers there. It is, it, is not, it is not substantially higher, right? You need to have slightly above the, uh, the mean mark. So in, in, in that sense, uh, you shouldn't be focusing on these small periods. What you need to focus on is there a reason why this 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 uh, this style or this factor actually works? Is there a uh, is there a rational for why I should be invested in it? And then does it work over over a reasonable period? Now extend uh, and how does it do well over cycles? Like uh, if you are in it for a complete cycle, net net, do you come out ahead? What is the volatility? Is it benefit? So there are a lot of parameters to look at. I wouldn't be too focused on just looking at a small uh, time period and making conclusions based on that. Yeah, please. So are this or so you can construct different portfolios because essentially, if you think about it, you are you will have signals that will uh, whichever signal you build, it'll it uh, you will have signal for all the stocks in your universe. Let's say you've got a stock, you've got a universe of BSE two hundred. You've got 200 stocks and then you've got signals for all the stocks in your universe. So now you can choose to either make a long only out of that by just using the best signals or you could make a long shot by, by deciding to short the stocks that have poor signals. So that comes down to, as I said, the benefit of quant is once you build the process, uh, then you can do a range of strategies because I have information of stocks that rank well. I have information of stocks that don't rank well. Now, if I'm building a long only product, what I can do is, let's say an index heavyweight has poor score. So then at best, I can hold zero in that stock. So I don't hold that stock. So I'm underweight that stock by whatever, 4%, 5% or even worst case, 8%. So that is the best I can do. But if you're doing a long shot, then I can actually go out and short that stock. So what you do with that information is completely down to uh, what kind of product you want to design and what kind of product you want to take to the market. So that is a separate decision. The, the, the model has the ability to do whatever you want to do. Uh, if you, uh, could you please use the mic uh, when you are asking a question, it's needed for the recording. Yeah, please raise your hand and I'll give you the mic. So, in one of the previous slides, um, you talked about quant, quant portfolios outperforming in emerging markets. Uh, yes, that was a for So, I was just curious if you have any thoughts on, you know, why that is the case. Excess returns in emerging markets for quant. So, uh, that was for a period between 2001 and 2009, uh, right, firstly. Second is that um, actually quant to people's perception, this is my own experience, uh, quant signals also do well in em emerging markets because it's not as exploited as it is in developed markets. In developed markets, there are a lot of people doing this, so these signals are quite exploited. Uh, whereas in emerging markets, we are still in the process of kind of uh, 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 picking up, ob obviously outside of, uh, if you take developed Asian markets, there there's still a lot of people doing it. Uh, whereas if you take emerging Asian, uh, uh, if you take emerging Asian markets, then there are very few uh, participants actually doing it. I mean, that number is on the rise, but it's still not, it's still nowhere close to what you see in developed markets. That could be one of the reasons, but it could also be a function of the fact that you're looking at it in a period that is, is, uh, is favors a certain strategy. Because all these things, as I said, the correlation between, you look at the right chart here, the correlation between these two strategies are, is quite low. So, the fact is when one of the strategy does well, the other will probably kind of uh, struggle and, and vice versa. So it could just be a fact of the time horizon that we are taking into account. One of the two reasons, uh, it could be any of these, uh, what we've discussed. Yeah, yeah. The first one makes a lot of sense and yeah, the second one also could be possible yeah. because of the time horizon. It could yeah. be, yeah, because at the end of the day, we are looking at a limited data sure. set. Thank you. Hi, uh, I have a couple of questions. So, firstly, uh, where we can get uh, historical data of the factors uh, uh, 
uh, and their performances, uh, not for India, but uh, at least for US type of markets, uh, and uh, which which can enc encompass all the factors and their performances, uh, standard deviation, and even uh, the distribution of that. Uh, hmm. So, th what what are the sources where we can refer to this? So, a lot, lot of academicians actually put it up there on their personal website, uh, okay. where they put uh, the returns data for, especially in the US, uh, this uh, this is the case where they put out uh, the uh, the performance of select factors and select styles, uh, and they update it quite diligently. Uh, okay. So, we can probably take so it. So, if you can refer some that will be helpful for us. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you. But I, I, sure. I mean, I do. I wouldn't have the website addresses no. at the top of my head, but there are a lot of people who actually do it, and I okay. know uh, the, the authors themselves, but the websites I'll have to get back to you. Okay, okay. And uh, secondly, uh, in, in, in your model, uh, what is the rebalancing frequency? Because some, some will perform better, some will perform less, and then you want to increase weight uh, of uh, yeah, some factors. Yes. So I'll, I'll talk about it more from a general model construction standpoint, right? So that comes down to actually it, it's the other way. Uh, normally people think you first build your alpha model, then you build your uh, so you build your model, then you uh, then decide how much turnover you want to have and so on and so forth. Actually, it's the other way because if I build a model that has high turnover and it's going to be deployed in a in a in a in a structure which is uh, tax inefficient, then that model is not worth deploying in that in that in that platform so it is actually kind of cyclical approach first you have to decide what is the kind of strategy that you want to deploy in what platform do you want to deploy uh, does that platform let you take more turnover let you uh, or is there a constraint i'm mean, turnover is one of the things you could put in a lot of other things if you're looking at long shot uh, is there a is there a cap on uh, the leverage levels uh, and so on so forth. There, there are a lot of parameters so you also have to think about the product before you start designing the signals or else you will end up with a, a perfectly good model and a perfectly good portfolio, but you can't implement it because for whatever reasons after implementation, uh, the return distribution is not, uh, is something that is uh, appealing to uh, the investor base, right? For some of the reasons I mentioned. So it has to be, uh, it's, it's a more cyclic, uh, it's a circular approach where you also have to take into account what is the kind of product that you want to do. And then you have to design your, design your model also accordingly. Hello. Yeah. So, data cleaning has been one of the most important crucial aspect I can say. Sorry, come again? Data cleaning. Uh, so, in your experience, uh, what has been the process which you followed and how do you deal with out, outliers basically? I mean, is there any specific methodology or something? I think like that? that that is that is where the crux is, right? So you have to. Look. It's more of an art, you want to say? Uh, it's not an art, but there is a process, and how you do it is basically where which is the which is the devil in the details, which is what is the processes. How do you identify it and how you clean it? That is the most dirtiest part. Uh, unfortunately, people think quant uh, when as external people when they look at it, they think quant is uh, uh, like looks like a very. Uh, 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 I am, I'm struggling for words because I want to use the right words, but essentially it looks like pretty sweet deal. It looks pretty attractive from the outside, but a lot of the time that I'm doing, it's, uh, it's, it's a very tedious job where you're looking at the data, you're looking at uh, uh, cross-sectional data constantly, trying to make sure that you're not making errors because the catch is uh, once you've built it uh, and you w once you put it in production, the repercussions are uh, uh, significant and also you don't want to keep going back between the first stage and the last stage. So you have to be very careful about how you kind of build it. So, which is where most of the pain is. Uh, and contrary to beliefs, most people, what most people believe, it is not as uh, all sweet sailing. Yeah. So to keep or not to keep the outliers, it totally depends, right? And how you treat the outliers yeah. and how you treat the outliers. Even if you decide to keep, how you treat the outliers. Uh, like you spoke about the data vendors, right? Uh, yeah. Bloomberg, Refinitiv and all. If you have to rank these in the order like from your experience, which are the best to us, uh, from the quality of data? I think all of them, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a, it's a small group. All of them uh, pr probably have similar quality. All of them have reasonable checks in place. But as I said, at the end of the day, irrespective of which source you choose, you still have to do your work. You cannot get away from the fact that, uh, f from that fact. You still have to look at the data, clean the data, look at ex outliers. That part is never going to go away, irrespective of which vendor you use. All of them are equally placed, I would say. Thank you. Actually, I had a question. Uh, the, the technology in artificial intelligence and machine learning has, hmm. uh, you know, changed a lot drastically in the last year. 
uh, in fact, there was a video where you know someone typed in what is Citadel's hedge fund strategy on Chat GPT, and the entire thing came out. Yep. So, uh, how do you think? I mean, what are the pros and cons of the emergence of AI, and will it make a significant change in the entire quant strategy, or will it just help it? Uh, I think in the immediate run, uh, in the immediate period, it will still. I think it's a it's a much more medium term horizon. Obviously, the you are constantly working on research as a quant. You don't make one model and just let it be, right? Uh, we have also other things to take into account. For instance, there are some data points that also, some data parameters that already have a history in the West, right? We are still in the process of kind of collecting that data uh, ourselves. Uh, so you have new data, new data uh, parameters that are beginning to show up as well in terms of critical uh, length of history. So you have that. So you still have new data sources that are coming, uh, that are emerging in our markets. And then there's the other aspect which is uh, on AI. But I think it's a much more medium term phenomenon rather medium to longer term phenomenon than something over the next year or year and a half. But it's uh, needless to stay, you have to stay abreast of it and you have to constantly work on it. Um, but at some levels it is also, I think the usage of that also needs to be uh, evaluate if it's really AI, if it's really machine learning, because a lot of things do sell in the name of machine learning and AI. Uh, so that also has to be uh, looked at. Do you think it's going to get easier over time to use ob 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 Obviously, it's gotten easier. Uh, there's no two doubts, uh, there's no two ways about the, especially with a lot of these softwares, uh, ability to deploy ML strategies, ability to, uh, uh, ability to, to evaluate, that's definitely gotten easier. Uh, that, that, that is true. Just sticking on from over there, uh, can AI help in doing the dirty work that you mentioned of cleaning the data? Um, not yet. I don't know yet. Uh, I don't know of a way yet. But if it if it does, that will be great. But uh, not yet. Maybe it it might help you with the outliers, but it still will. You'll still need to figure out how to uh, clean it yourself, right? How is the marketing effort for marketing something of quant nature different than uh, marketing the traditional uh, active management funds? I think two things. First, uh, with regards to marketing quant, there is also a uh, learning or a, uh, uh, there is an uh, investor education process. That uh, uh, There are two things. One, you have to explain what quant is uh, because people have misconceptions around quant as to what a quant strategy can do. Uh, and then you also have to explain what the product actually does. Uh, and as quants, uh, we have to also set realistic expectations in, what, in terms of what the product can do and what it cannot do. For instance, when during this presentation, I emphasize that it is not quants versus fundamentals, but you need to invest in both set of products. It, like one process is not fundamentally superior or inferior than the other. It is just thinking of, like you would think about two asset classes. Uh, so expectation setting, Edu uh, investor kind of education and then also then subsequently marketing a product and needless to say it helps if your product is not black box because you don't want to go and say uh, at least from a process perspective I, I don't like it personally where, wherein it is just because of the model right so it has to be put down in a very uh, you one should be able to explain what the model is and what the process is in in a in a in a very simple way or in a way that seems quite logical, even from a fundamental, uh, from a from a from a logical construct, right? So, uh, it's a simple question. Yeah. Uh, maybe just reflecting my stupidity. How much? How different is quant from HFT? High uh, frequency trading. So HFT is also a subset of it, but uh, essentially. Uh, that is at the higher end of, so if you think about quant, you can have something like a very low uh, turnover uh, strategy and then you could go to the extreme, very extreme and then you can, high, you can have a high turnover strategy which is what you are referring to. So it is all part of the spectrum uh, and obviously what happens is the low turnover strategies can take a lot of capacity whereas the high turnover strategy, the capacity is quite limited. So they are all part of the product spectrum. It's a spectrum. It's a spectrum. Uh, one part and, of the spectrum. And obviously people specialize in their, uh, in different areas, but it is, it is all part of that spectrum. Okay. But 
uh, is it constructed in a similar manner like you just mentioned with no. all these data points or no that uh, is that is much more driven by uh, i'm not an expert there let me let me paraphrase that uh, i'm not an expert on that side of things but uh, it is much more based on uh, 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 price and volume related data and uh, order book depth of order book and things like that rather than uh, rather than uh, slow moving signals by definition they can't have slow moving signals they have to have faster moving signals okay okay thank you so uh, like you said it's becoming easier with ai and we are seeing a lot of fund houses now come up with these strategies given it's become i mean given it's going towards more of a commoditized uh, mm. manner what is, what are the chances of particular fund managers creating alpha or over each other so how do you basically so I said, as i said uh, there is a lot of uh, details into how you build build a model i mean there are as you know there are a, uh, there are few uh, quant mutual funds and you can look at the and all of this is public data you can take a look at these funds how they are you can look at the portfolio construction process which is fundamentally different you can look at the signals that they talk about is is very different uh, we are nowhere even close to that point where you can say that uh, there is a lot of money chasing uh, th th these signals we are not even we are not even on that uh, ladder yet there is a long way to go from that perspective and this question is no different than saying all there are so many fundamental managers there what is the ability of a new fundamental manager to to uh, to uh, extract alpha so if if that question if you have not hit that point with regards to fundamental managers we are far away from in, at least domestically in terms of quant but having said that like i pointed out with develop uh, develop markets the more participants you get some of the more commonly known signals probably will get exploited bit more so you have to keep working on your research so which is why you can't have a model and then hope to have it work forever research is an ongoing process at the end of the day that is the forte of the portfolio manager or the or the that is the forte of the quant team in general in terms of improving that process so that process cannot stop is is my point but given where we are in our stage of development i think we are far away from that point so i think that will answer the question that we had about ai taking over uh, quant rules quant management rules uh, you could argue ai could take over not just quant but uh, lot of fund fundamental management <laughs> And, and if there is one AI model that's going to take over, then every that it's all going to go to gravitate towards the. Uh, screen. So, but yeah. Uh, okay, so I think we've run out of time for questions. Uh, so thank you so much, Karthik. Uh, I think uh, this was a very insightful session, and uh, I think a perfect way to end the financial new year.